Welcome to The Bridge, your health, your voice. The official podcast for the University of Maryland, Baltimore School of Pharmacy Patients. The Patients Program is the bridge between the community and research. The Patients Program created this partnership to help researchers listen to the community's voice in order to build a bridge to an effective learning healthcare community. Here's your host, Rodney Elliott. I'm excited about um, you guys learning a little bit more about Chalisa and Brittany, what they do and how they do it and what they bring to the patients program. So um, before we get into questions, I'm going to reach out to both of them. I'll let them share a little bit about who they are, what they do, and then uh, we'll have some questions uh, about their role here as um, senior community program specialists and senior health program specialists. Brittany, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, um, but about what's your role here? And that little icebreaker is um, what you like most about your job, right? Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Brittany Harris, and I'm the senior engagement uh, specialist here with the uh, Patients Program. Um, a part of my role here is developing strategies to engage stakeholders uh, to know more about what the Patients Program is and what we do. Um, Everything is centered around health equity. So a lot of the conversations that I'm having with or the organizations that I uh, desire to engage with and develop relationships with um, fit within health, the health equity bucket um, and our ability to, to support, ability and desire to support the community and understand the health equity and what goes into that. What I love most um, about working with the patients program is the, I want to say the culture of our um, internal community that okay. we have here, um, that the team is, each individual is very passionate about the work that they do and very intentional um, in understanding the communities uh, that we serve mm -hmm. um, and how they can do it better. Even if they do something, they always want to circle back and what can we do better? Um, and I love that because I've been a part of teams where people just get the job done and check off a um, check off something on the list and just keep it pushing, and they don't come back and and try to understand what they could have potentially done wrong. Gotcha. What they could have done better gotcha. with with the input of the communities that they serve. So that's what I love most is that we work directly with the community. The culture around here, the patients program. I can echo that as well. Has been, um, you know, we kind of help each other. Um, you know, as we go along, because again, when you talk about health equity, we talk about these community, there isn't one template that fits each group. So being flexible knowing and understanding that, and most importantly, communicating that is a huge, um, component of what we do here at the patients program. Talisa, do you mind sharing with our listeners a little bit about who you are, what you do, and again, what do you like so far most about your role here as the Senior Health Program Specialist with the Patients Program. <laughs> Thank you, Rodney. Hello, everyone. As Rodney said, my name is Teresa Colby. I am a Senior Health Program Specialist here with the Patients Program. My role has kind of varied since I've been here. I've kind of had my hand in all things, um, but mainly I help um, manage, um, coordinate, implement, and evaluate the um, programs and projects that we have going on here at the Patients Program. Um, one of the main ones being our um, Patients Professors Academy mm -hmm. and our um, PPA Continuous Engagement Program that we come up with. Um, so I would say the thing I like most about working here so far, my job so far, I'm going to echo Brittany a little bit. I really love the culture, um, the internal culture. It kind of feels like we're all a family who comes into the office every week and has the same goals as far as you know, how we want to impact the community, which is to, of course, increase health equity and improve health outcomes um, for the West Baltimore community. When we're talking about how do you build relationships with di diverse communities to promote health equity, how do you build on those relationships? How do you prepare for those relationships when we're talking about diverse communities and to promote health equity? Is it something that you bring from your work um, prior to being the patients program, or is it something that you learn here that you uh, bring to the table when you're building those relationships? How I build uh, relationships with diverse communities um, in an effort to pr 
promote um, health equity is I listen. Is active listening is very important. Mm-hmm. Active listening to the community's voice um, and understanding the very unique needs and challenges yeah. of each community is critical because you never want to show up to a community providing cookie cutter resources Mm -hmm. um, and they may not need them or they haven't asked for something else or additional resources that you had no knowledge of because you didn't sit and have a conversation. Um, And it's not about posing questions, but sometimes just listen to them speak. Yeah, You'll hear that people echo the same thing in a certain community. Uh, one community may say, you know, we have uh, a food desert over here. And another community could say, you know, we need more transportation or support transportation to get to, to the hospital and things like that. Yeah. You have to listen and take that back to whoever the power that be and um, identify what resources you can pull into that community if the, if there's a space for that. And also effectively communicating that we don't have all of the answers. And we may not have all of the resources, but this is what I can guide you to. Um, and the other part is being inclusive and like culturally sensitive to uh, the different approaches that we take to uh, co-create uh, an initiative with the community. Their voice matters. And I think that with the patients program, it is what I've seen highlighted is that we have the platform and not just utilizing it for ourselves, but to uplift our community and their voices and their needs. When you feel like you know what the community needs or know what the community wants, um, and you go in there doing that initially, you didn't come, you, you didn't come listening. You come with all the answers and as good as the project may sound or as good as an opportunity may sound again, that community just might not be ready to receive that information yet. So having the ability to turn your listening ears on when you're out and about in the community, when we're in these meetings or we're supporting um, events is crucial and important to the work that we do with the patients program, particularly with the engagement team, because we are boots on the ground when it comes to um, engagement. When we're talking about um, collaborating with local organizations or stakeholders, again, to advance that health equity goals um, in that health equity space, your role as the uh, program specialist, I know a couple of projects that you're working on where you're making phone calls or exchanging emails or communicating with external folks. Um, How do you collaborate with local organizations and stakeholders to advance health equity goals? I feel like when working with um, community programs and projects where You do have um, local organizations and stakeholders involved. I feel like one of the most important things that you can do is make sure that your goals and your vision and your mission, along with the stakeholders' goals and vision and mission for the community or whatever population that you're targeting, are aligned. Um, Not only the goals and mission and vision aligned, but also I find that the character uh, the people in the organization or just the integrity of the organizations and stakeholders, period, is also aligned um, with the work that we're trying to do because we are working with communities and um, populations that, you know, the history between them and research or the medical field, it, it isn't good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There isn't a lot of, uh, what can I say, trust there. When you have people that are coming in and doing research, kind of everything to the community members, everything else kind of goes out the door when they hear that word research. (laughs) So I feel like where the um, local organizations and the stakeholders come in is they kind of help ease us into the community or help promote that trust um, and that and that relationship so that you know, the patients program and the community can work in junction together to promote health equity. So I think it's very, very important dealing with when dealing with stakeholders and local organizations, you look for organizations and groups of people that the community already knows they're well aware of and that they trust most importantly. Um, And like, that's the best way you're going to go about um, starting to promote health equity and getting 
the community involved in patient centers outcome research to to promote health equity because if we're not involved in the research um we don't have the knowledge or the data to know what to do to get those positive outcomes you know when you talk about trust and establishing and sustaining relationships you have to have your listening ears on right you know Brittany talked about the importance of listening early you're talking about the importance of um, meeting the community where they are. The name of this podcast is called The Bridge for that specific reason is because you have to, two people on different sides of the bridge, you have to come across or walk with each other or meet the community where they are to kind of understand a little bit more. So having a seat at the table when it comes to different type of health issues, um, you can only get to that point if you've listened, if you've established relationships with the community, established relationships with the research world, and make sure that it makes sense for both sides, right? And the work that we do. So the engagement piece is important. The project management piece is just as important. They both go hand in hand when it comes to that health equity piece. Going to keep going on, and the next question is geared to you, Brittany, when it comes to um, a successful community engagement event or initiative. Um, you know, pretty sure when you saw this um, job application online, and then, you know, I made it align with some of the work you've done before. I've had opportunity to being meets with you. We had conversation of some of the work you've done before, but for our listeners, um, can you provide an example of a successful community engagement initiative that you've been a part of and what made that event successful? In another role, who previously uh, as an engagement coordinator for Baltimore City Recreation and Parks, for some years, the mayor would do uh, like block parties during mm-hmm. the dawn. Um, and so I was able to contribute to the collaboration of organizing uh, the block parties. Um, and that work, that happened through collaboration. It happened with coll- uh, having uh, sustainable relationships with community members, um, with city council members, um, cross collaboration, you know, with agencies and definitely having a connection with my internal team to be able to contribute and execute such a large and ongoing uh, project. Yeah. Um, it was really about team building and really about collaboration and community coming together and also identifying something that the community said they needed. They needed something for the youth to participate in. So again, working uh, with the recreation centers, working with the families, working with um, the city agency, specifically uh, DPW, uh, working with the police department, community associations, just everyone pooling together um, and having this intersection where we all just say, hey, this is what I have and this is my idea and this is how we're going to execute it. And it it was it was challenging, but it was just really exciting to know what resources existed in our city and to also know that we can come together and we can do amazing things that support our youth and our families um, in Baltimore. We always talk about here in the Patients Program um, impact, right? How do you measure impact for our community, Um, particularly some of the initiatives that we um, are getting uh, involved in or some of the projects we're getting aligned in? Um, And your role as health program specialist, Taking on the PPA from a managerial perspective, how do you measure the impact of our community engagement initiatives, um, our projects, when it comes to health equity? As far as measuring impact, we measure our impact directly from our participants or the group or the population that we're working with. So whether it be from the community community advisory board that works on that project or the actual participants like the PPA graduates, um, we collect, we either have impact stories that we collect, yep. um, just the personal feedback from people who have attended PPA or who have graduated from PPA that come back and tell us how they're utilizing what they've learned um, from the PPA program to promote health equity in their own jobs or their own communities. But we also do do um, qualitative analysis with um, evaluations that we have. So we work with WESTAT. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but they're a research company. And um, we create a survey that addresses each aspect and components of the PPA. And after the PPA, we give them a survey. Then a year later, we give them another survey. 
um, asking questions about how they felt about the PPA, what could have been done better, did we miss anything? And fortunately, with PPA, it's one of those programs that come back with about a 96% like we did everything right. <laughs> so um, it's just a wonderful program to work with. And even with community engagement, and I see some other projects going around, um, even small projects like Patience Day um, last year, just the feedback from the community, you know, that attended the event, um, how it impacted them, how they can use some of the tools from the speakers there um, to deal with grief. Uh, how just people telling their stories made them open up. So sometimes you can just see the impact itself by people, you know, speaking at the end of the event or, or during the event, but we're always sure to have like that, you know, qualitative data and then that quantitative data from the actual surveys and we stat too. So we have a couple of different um, avenues on how we measure the impact of the work that we're doing. And of course, another one, um, that is very simple. It's, it's funding. <laughs> oh, yeah. If, if, our, if our sponsors fund us again, then we're making a pretty good impact. <laughs> very true. I know we're talking about creating some events where we can be more out um, out in the community. Um, what experience do you have in community engagement and health equity that you can bring to the patients program? I address these factors through community-driven initiatives where I work directly with the community to, again, whatever falls in those buckets of social determinants of health, that's how I kind of frame the events that I have. Um, because I don't have to have so much input from the community because the data already supports it. And the data came from the community. I mean, it comes to social determinants of health. We talk about it all the time. It isn't a cookie cutter or a, um, you know, exact size for each group being out in those communities, listening to our stakeholders, um, coming together and collaborating, give us opportunities to fill those buckets, to drop some jewels in those buckets. So I do look forward to that um, as uh, we grow here in the Patients Program. Patients Professors Academy, it's in its third year um, where it's opportunity for uh, community members, uh, research um, investigators, um, funders, uh, folks in the academia space, caregiving space, all come together for a six week course where they actually learn how to do the work that we do uh, at the patients program and be able to um, branch out in, in different areas and respect the work that they do. Um, but all looking at research and community engagement from a patient's lens, I think that's one of the things that it was harped to me when I first got here in the patients program six years ago is that we try to provide stories and share instances from a lot of different lenses, right? Research lens, community member lens. But when you dig down or get a little deeper, you know, um, our principal investigator has questions, has concerns. Our, our caregiver has questions and concerns that contribute to this whole health equity space. So, Brittany, can you talk about some strategies that um, you use um, when it comes to ensuring uh, inclusivity and accessibility um, in our community engagement efforts? Again, you know, I'm boots on the ground. We're boots on the ground when it comes to community engagement. But there's other ways that you can engage the community. Uh, in a, in a thorough way. So um, what would you bring or what do you hope to bring to the patients program when it comes to strategies that ensure inclusivity and accessibility um, when it comes to some of our community engagement efforts? I'm excited that you framed it with hope to bring. So I want our listeners to know that these are hopes and dreams and, and, and strategies that have not been implemented yet, right? So uh, one of the things, um, one of the strategies for inclusivity and accessibility would be uh, bilingual events or having uh, the ability to have all of our documents translated. Um, because of the diverse pop, uh, population and communities that we have uh, in Baltimore, um, a hope and a dream and a prayer of mine would be that where we do have events that we could provide transportation if if possible for some communities that would love to engage with us and get to know us or um, have access to uh, opportunities and resources that they get uh, transported to the event. Yeah. Um, and using diverse communication channels such as like social media, 
specifically Instagram. I would love to do that. Um, but currently, you know, we have a X or Twitter, we have Facebook, we have this lovely podcast. Um, and we also have, oh, what? LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, and one last beautiful thing that we're currently u- utilizing is a, a newsletter uh, that we send out. Um, but when directly engaging in curating events in the community, I would, I always, I'm always so intentional about the experience of, uh, the person on the other side. So I want to prioritize accessible, um, venues and materials so that everyone, um, can participate and benefit, uh, from our efforts. Um, but those are the strategies that I have in mind. We talk about meeting the community where they are here at the Patients Program. And um, that's something I've heard when I first got here. I still hear it now. And that could be as simple as me or us going to an outreach event in West Baltimore. Yes, that's meeting the community where they are. But there are some folks who are getting their information from different spaces nowadays. So this is where the podcast came from, right? Um, having a good relationship internally with our team, Eric and I, um, post-pandemic, thought about ways to still stay engaging and meet people where they are. And as folks were kind of getting acclimated to whatever the new world looked like or started to look like, some felt comfortable receiving information at home or from their device or, you know, from social media. So um, the bridge is a byproduct of that. And uh, we're excited about where this is going. You have plans to address some of the systematic barriers that are um, related to health equity within the communities, whether it's your role now at project management or just in general with the patients program? Um, thanks, Rodney. That's a good question. Um, when I, one of the main reasons um, that I chose to work here, not it wasn't only because of the programs and the work that's already in place, but also because of the potential I saw with this program and the programs that it could implement that would really benefit um, the Black community or minority populations or underserved populations in West Baltimore. And I feel like an issue that um, that I would like to see being tackled, even though I know it's a little harder because you're dealing with underage um, participants, is the youth. Um, I feel like here in Baltimore, especially the cities, you know, the education system is um, not where it should be. And I feel like it does have an impact on the youth and youth health outcomes, um, whatever those outcomes may be. And I feel like also um, ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences, also contribute to like the outcomes of the youth here in Baltimore, um, especially the city. So I would love to see um, programming or work done to address that because I feel like when, you know, those educational barriers become a thing and, um, like Brittany was saying earlier, like places for the youth to have safe recreation and just feel safe and, you know, be a kid and things like that. I feel like it's not addressed as much as it could be. And I feel like patience does have um, room to address that just because of ACEs and, um, you know, childhood traumas and generational traumas and how cycles keep going and they aren't broken. And most of these cycles started, if you want to get real, you know, from slavery here, you know, and, um, Some of us haven't been able to get out of that cycle of survival, if that makes sense. So that's something I would like to see being brought here um, as far as women, Black women and maternal health, um, pregnancy. I would love to see um, those outcomes improve, too. I believe there's a big space for research when it comes to um, maternal health and um, infant health for our Black and Black and brown babies, I believe the patients program has a capacity to make a difference there as far as getting research um, as to why black mothers are treated differently, as to why they are dying um, two time, at two times, three times faster than what, the rate than our, our white counterparts. You know, that's a systemic issue that can be addressed with um, patient centers, outcome research, education, um, awareness and intervention. So those are two of the main things that I would like to see here. And I'm getting on a rampage, but also I feel like um, a holistic health model for um, this community and how that will positively impact health outcomes. I feel like that's something that can be addressed here, can be addressed also because 
when we look at certain outcomes, health outcomes, health equity, you know, the whole person is not being addressed. Maybe we're just addressing the physical, but what about the mental, the emotional, the spiritual that got us to these bad physical outcomes as well? So I believe more research as far as holistic health, um, faith and spirituality and how that impacts health outcomes would improve health equity too. So those are the three main areas here that I see um, that I would like to get my hands into um, because I believe those three areas really have a strong impact as far as getting to the root of, you know, why some of these health trends and um, negative outcomes exist in our community and have existed for, for so long. Um, I believe tackling those issues would get to the root of that and kind of push us into a um, break the cycle and push us into a more positive cycle, if that makes sense. That it's all sense in the world having a seat at the tables. What that sound like that, you know, <laughs> yeah, me and, uh, and really, I didn't want to cut you off. I want you to add on to that as well. You said something that I want to piggyback on was about uh, our ability, if we could, uh, to support the youth. Um, and I think about that often as I engage with adults, parents, and seniors, um, that they do have children, they do have grandchildren and nieces and nephews, and they will be adults at some point. So to to provide resources and support and and capture data and information and to identify how we could, we could be supportive now, which could impact their future, I think would be a world of it, it just would be transformative. And I wish we did get to do work with these because they are a part of my hard work and my passion. And they have a lot to do with uh, what my why my resume looks the way that it does um, and working in communities in Baltimore because I love the youth and I understand that if we do not cater to them, if we do not show up and support them, what does our future look like? Because they will be adults and if they have nothing now, and they don't get what they need now, um, and we wait until they're adults to support them. It's it's not a good, it's not a great cycle. It's not a great outcome. And we we've seen this time and time again. Um, and I just wish we could do more because what we're doing now, in my opinion, has nothing to do with my work here. My personal opinion is it is not enough. We are talking about systemic barriers, and we're talking about a whole population, um, a whole city, a whole county. You have to get the youth. Like the children, they really are the future to change. You have to have the intervention where it really matters, which is in the youth. It's really hard to change. It's not saying it's not possible, but it's really hard to change certain behaviors, especially the mindset when you're already a certain age. It's, it's really good to get them while they're young. And I just saw news that, you know, Baltimore is is opening, um, has gotten $1 million funding for a, a prison or a new juvenile center or something like that. $1 million. What about the schools <laughs> that are falling apart, that don't have air in the, uh, that don't have air in the summertime, that don't have textbooks? You know what I'm saying? What about wellness centers? What about intervention centers instead? This million dollars could be going, you know what I'm saying? To other places instead of a prison. The approach to this whole thing, as far as health equity, when you're looking at it from a um, holistic perspective, when you're looking at it from a whole family perspective, when you're looking at it from the youth as well, is so, so, so important. And um, I know the patients program is in great hands um, with uh, Brittany Harris, new to the program, and with Trelisa Colby, new to the program, and having innovative ideas and strategies on how to engage our community, how to work with um, different stakeholders, and to be quite honest, how to speak up for our communities, right? I know we all do share a passion for wanting to work with our communities, particularly the youth, and um, I think we do or can see that um, as part of the FACES program initiative going forward, but we work with the family as a whole, so, um, you know, I echo some of the uh, initiatives that both of you guys uh, want to um, bring to the patients program, want to help with the patients program, and uh, just letting you guys know right now since you've been here with us, your hard work isn't going unnoticed. Um, I appreciate all the contributions that we have to our meetings, to our strategies, um, to our events going forward. And uh, I look for uh, uh, more positive and more innovative approaches to how we engage our community, how we educate, and how we um, give our community opportunities to have those seats at the table so they can speak for themselves. Thank you for listening to The Bridge. Your health, your voice. 
To learn more about the Patients Program, visit our website at www.patients.umaryland.edu.